1955, in the depths of the Cold War, the US Navy launched a classified program to deploy underwater microphones in an attempt to track enemy movements. But amongst the deep mechanical rumblings of the distant submarines, they also detected something strange, an eerily haunting whine that echoed across the ocean. For years, the source of these strange recordings went undiscovered. Unidentified ships or unknown geological phenomena seemed the most likely explanation. That was until the files became declassified and were handed to a young biologist who suggested another option. That we were listening in to the conversations of one of the largest and loudest animals on the planet, the humpback whale. Previously thought of as a silent beast of the ocean, whale calls became a source of deep fascination for scientists and restless sleepers around the world. But the deeper we listened, the more we started to understand. This might be more than just noise. Now, new research published in the academic journal of science suggested that these whale calls may follow structured patterns that look eerily similar to the way humans communicate, and may in fact be a language just as complex as our own. Today I want to dive into the depths of the ocean to decode the mysteries of whale speech and how we're redefining communication between our species, but first, let's start with something simple, learning Japanese. Let's talk about talking. Listen to this. Unless you're a Japanese speaker, that probably sounded like a stream of indistinguishable noise, and in the politest way possible, it kind of is. But here's the thing, so is English. What did you just say? When you hear a sentence in your own language, it feels like the words arrive perfectly spaced and distinct. But that isn't true. Take the sentence, that young gentleman has a physics PhD. You can almost hear the natural pauses between words. Except you can't, because there aren't any. Actually, each word blurs into the next, and that's before we even get to complex languages. I mean, I told these, I mean, this is if animals are for war, so we've had to got that green lane when I was. Here, your brain is doing something extraordinary. It knows to break the noises it hears into meaningful sounds, syllables, words, and then sentences by mapping the probability of individual noises belonging to the next one in the series. A word like that is made up of component noises. A and T. English is made up of about 40 of these distinguishable noises that we called phonemes, which combine together to form syllables which then form together to make words. The likelihood of one of these phonemes leading to another is called its transition probability. Th into A in that has a high transition probability. We hear this combination of noises frequently, thanks, thatch, and obviously Thanos. There are also combinations of sounds with almost zero transition probability, like N and H, whose combined sounds obviously sound something like like, which we don't hear that often in English. This low transition probability tells us this is a likely gap between words and clues our brains into making an artificial pause. This process of grouping the likelihood of transitions together, where low probability transitions indicate the ends of words, is called boundary segmentation, and is how our brains block and group noises that we make to each other together. Largely, you learn this process by brute force, as a child listening to tens of thousands of hours and taking clues from visual context, intonation, stress and rhythm to find and remember the boundaries of words and sentences. <laughs> this capability is obviously powerful for us understanding each other, otherwise mundane sentences like I like ice cream suddenly turn in profoundly unsettling minimalist haikus, I like ice cream. As we start to look at the larger organizational structure of our language, we also notice something interesting. The shorter word segments that we use, things like the and and, occur more often in daily use than the longer word segments like anti-neutrino, that is, unless you're a nerd. Also, if we plot all the words in something like war and peace, we find that the most frequent used words occur twice as frequently as the next commonly used words, and so on and so forth, following a power law. We call this the Zipfian distribution. This distinctive pattern is found across all human languages and is something that we feel characterizes the true complexity of human communication, and we've often rested on that idea as a source of pride and uniqueness among the animal kingdom. That was until 1967, when a young biologist named Roger Payne found himself listening to those eerie recordings from the US Navy's submarine detection experiment and realized that the noises made were far more complex than we ever imagined. 
They contained a series of beautiful and varied sounds, but within each recording, Payne found that segments of the recording seemed to repeat themselves, and that those repetitions had periods of between 7 and 30 minutes, where each individual noise or call was then repeated in order, frequency, and rhythm with perfect precision. These were not just random noises, but songs. Songs with choruses two to ten times longer than most of our pop songs. And Payne found that these songs could be passed from individual to individual. Even more astonishing, he realized that these songs weren't static, evolving over time, sometimes with rapid bursts of creativity, the birth of an entirely new music trend. I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. Which then would be passed on and repeated by other individuals. Payne's discovery was revolutionary. At a time when whales were still being hunted commercially, few people had given much thought to their intelligence. But these songs suggested something more, a form of communication that was rich, intricate, and possibly even a marker of a shared whale culture. The idea that the whales could possess something akin to language captured the public's imagination. Payne released Songs of the Humpback Whale, an album that became the best-selling vinyl record of all time. Take that, Beyonce. I love whales. Ultimately, Payne's work helped ignite the global anti-whaling movement. And then, because it was the 60s, things got kind of weird. For those of you too young to remember the 60s, here's our stock montage. Dr. John Lilly entered the scene with some pretty inventive methods, and unlike traditional marine biologists who studied whale behavior in the wild, Lilly sought to create controlled environments where he could interact directly with dolphins. One of his most radical experiments involved attempting to teach dolphins to communicate with humans in spoken English. He designed an ambitious project, a flooded house where a young researcher, Margaret Howe, lived with a dolphin named Peter in an attempt to teach him human speech. Over the course of six weeks, Peter learned English and went on to write the famous childhood series, Harry Potter. No wait, the experiment totally failed. And because again it was the 60s, Lily instead became deeply involved in psychedelic drug research and started administering LSD to dolphins in the hopes of facilitating interspecies communion, which totally and unexpectedly also ended in absolute failure. This set of experiments were widely criticized by the scientific community for their ethical and methodological flaws, and that's kind of where we left things. Human whale communication became a bit of a ridiculed and orphaned area of scientific exploration. That was until something weird happened. We had a 20 minute conversation with a whale. And I will talk about that conversation, but first I have to thank today's paid partner, BetterHelp. Our brains are wired to make sense of noise, to extract meaning from chaos, whether it's human speech or even whale song, but sometimes that same wiring can work against us. Our thoughts loop, anxiety creeps in, and before we know it, our brains are stuck in a pattern we can't break. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp connects you with a credentialed therapist who can help you understand and untangle your thoughts, whether you're dealing with anxiety, seasonal changes, or just the mental equivalent of a tangled up whale song. Over 69% of members report improvements with their anxiety symptoms after just six weeks of therapy. It's simple to start, just fill out a questionnaire and you'll be matched with a therapist who fits your needs. And if it's not the right fit, you can switch at any time at no extra cost. BetterHelp has over 7,000 reviews and a 4.3 rating on Trustpilot, so if you've ever thought about trying therapy, now is the time. Click the link in the description down below and go to betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Ben Miles to get 10% off your first month. Now, back to the whales. In 2021, off the coast of Alaska, a team of marine researchers from the Whale SETI project, which is exactly what you imagine it to be, lowered a speaker into the water. Their goal was to broadcast a pre-recorded humpback contact call, a sound believed to help whales stay connected over long distances, and observe if any whales would respond. They had no idea whether a live whale would actually be able to recognize or even engage with an artificial signal, but within minutes of playing the call, a known humpback whale in the area, Twain, appeared near the boat and to the scientist's amazement, she responded. The researchers, realizing they had caught her attention, played the sound again, and again, Twain answered back. Each time the scientist broadcast a call, Twain would respond. But that's no big deal, surely. We know that animals like parrots can imitate the noises that we make. That's nothing special, right? Except here, something strange was happening. When the research team introduced a time delay between their calls of, say, 10 seconds, Twain's return call was similarly delayed. She would wait 10 seconds after the researcher's call before issuing her next response. 
This behavior went back and forth, with Twain synchronizing her response to the delay between each call from the researchers, for a total of 20 minutes of continual exchanges. We have never seen an animal respond to us where the time since we last talked to them is perfectly factored in to their answer to us, down to the second, and it finds you asking a kind of weird question of yourself. Do whales understand time? Or at least here, something about cadence or rhythm seemed to be really important to them and worth understanding. After 20 minutes, Twain made it clear that she was over this probably very dull conversation to her, gave her final call and dived deep into the ocean. And the scientists were left with the feeling that they'd just had this profound experience. But was it really? Was this just a game of copycat or was this actually language? That remained a deep philosophical question for years, until just last month, when a groundbreaking new paper was published in the Journal of Science. Eight years worth of humpback whale songs were analyzed using the same models we described earlier. This time, rather than English's mere 40 sounds, the team identified a set of 150 distinct noises that whales frequently relied upon in their calls. These had catchy inclusions like squeak, groan, and my personal favorite, pulsed N-shaped moan. We've all made one. From the identification of these discrete noises, the team then mapped the transition probability between each sound, and found that a larger structure reliably repeated between some calls but not others. A pulsed N-shaped moan into a descending squeak was a very common transition, but rarely did a regular squeak transition into a pulsed N-shaped moan. What this indicated to the team was that there were rules of logic or syntax into how certain sounds can be combined together, and that there were boundaries between discrete sounds. The researchers had found syllables and something akin to words. The idea that Twain may actually have been saying words back to us was fascinating, but what was it that potentially explained the importance of timing and cadence in her responses. In a study back in 2024 on sperm whales, researchers found that as a sperm whale started a call, a nearby sperm whale would issue a response adjusting its speed, delay, or frequency of its calls to match the first whale. Here as the tempo of the first whale changed, the second whale adjusted its call to match this rhythm. This is almost like turning the dial of an FM radio to maintain a set of calls back and forward between a pair of communicating whales. They also found that periodically between either long exchanges or when switching off between communications of multiple whales, a singular standalone additional click sound would also be issued. Roger that. Almost like a punctuation point at the end of a sentence or an over or call sign. This ability to lens in to the response time and frequency of another whale may be important across whale communication to help individuals converse together above the noise of the ocean or among a larger pod of whales. But again, maybe we're just reading into this all too deeply. Perhaps whales make these sounds follow from one another just because some are physically easier to chain together or sound better than others. Is there any actual evidence that the whale's word choice actually follows the typical patterns we see in complex human language? Back to that 2025 science publication, when the team conducted an analysis of the words that make up the whale song by ordering word length against its frequency within the song, they find that just like in all human languages, shorter words occur more frequently than longer ones. And when they analyzed the frequency and commonality of those words, they found that the most common words words are used twice as frequently as the next most common words, replicating perfectly the Zipfian distribution that we thought only belonged to human language. For the very first time in any animal we have ever studied, we see the strongest evidence that we have ever seen for a complexity of structure so remarkably similar to our own, it feels very compelling to say that we are witnessing true, complex whale language. Right. Which makes us ask the only sensible question that we can at this point. What on earth are they talking about? The question on most people's minds here will be, so can we actually decode anything that these whales are saying back and forth to each other? Are they in fact saying anything at all? Now that's got a simple answer and a complicated answer. The simple answer is, we have no idea. The complicated answer is, we have no idea yet. To actually map out any level of meaning to individual noises, words, or sentences would require us to have a deeper understanding of the context and circumstances that these noises are delivered in. Though that doesn't mean that we haven't figured anything out. Back in 2008, researchers discovered that sperm whales repeat unique click patterns when approaching others. These patterns are rhythmically distinct to each individual, and whales respond differently depending on which clicking pattern they hear. It seems that sperm whales may have 
love, recognize, and remember each other by something equivalent to a name. We worked this out because every single dataset that we have at the start of a whale interaction began this way, which meant that we just had a lot of data. To work out anything else, we'll need a similar clear and correlated dataset from experiments. It's also worth highlighting that if we do this, we may find that there is no meaning associated with any of these words. The value of language to us is to append discrete words onto complex concepts and use the exchange of words to transfer ideas between individuals. This may simply just not be the case for whales. The value of deep structuring of how they compose sounds and chain them together might just be that. These rules, if followed really well, with high levels of structure, timing, and rhythm, might just indicate good quality cognitive genetics and a good quality mate. What we can say is that the level of complexity in this capability will have come at some cost and difficulty to develop, so it likely does have some meaningful value. To understand if there is any deeper meaning here, we need better data, and that may encourage a return to the fabled experiments of Dr. John Lilly, less the LSD bit and more the close observation of whales bit. If we had better understanding of what stimulus resulted in what response, if we could drop food into the ocean and heard a particular call issued as a result, or if we could observe whales when exposed to the presence of a predator and heard what they said in response, maybe we could even learn that there is a whale equivalent to... to it would take a huge amount of additional research and additional data to place any meaning onto the sounds that we are hearing. But taking what we learn in this process, we could maybe start to turn our attention away from the ocean depths and up to the stars. The hypothesis that complex language, maybe regardless of species, follows these similar traits, patterns, and structures may be a tool that we can apply to some of the strange and unidentified signals that we periodically receive on Earth from outer space. I did a video on one of them, you can watch here or down in the description below. As we advance this research, maybe we are even capable of turning it to even grander ambitions, and finally bridging an even wider communication gap. There was a quarry, you know that, you know, that field is called a quarry? Yeah, yeah. See what I mean? Oh, yeah. I'm kind of hoping that the first thing that aliens say to us isn't, why on earth didn't you listen to the whales? Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you guys next week. Goodbye.